Good evening. This is Whitney King, my Cellus Professor of Chemistry at Colby College. Today I'm going to talk about water quality in the Belgrade Lakes. And this first image shows two scenarios for the Belgrade Lakes watershed. On the right side is East Pond, which is exhibiting a distinct algae bloom at the time of this photograph, which was taken in 2012. And on the west side is North Pond, which looks pretty clear, or black in this image, because you can actually see the bottom of the lake from the airplane. The question is, what differentiates these two lakes? What processes are occurring that would cause East Pond to bloom and North Pond to remain clear? What I hope to show you over the next 15 slides is that the water quality in our lakes is due to a delicate balance between the inflow and the outflow of phosphorus. The phosphorus balance is controlled by a combination of climate change and human development, and it is going to be important that we take a watershed-wide approach toward reestablishing a normal phosphorus balance to all of our lakes. The Belgrade lakes are an interconnected chain consisting of eight lakes with water flowing from the headwater lake of East Pond into North Pond, from North Pond into Great Pond. McGrath and Salmon lakes also flow into Great Pond, and then Great Pond flows into the North Basin of Long, South Basin of Long, Snow Pond, and then finally into the Kennebec River. The diagrams show the average volume and shape of each lake, and so you can see that East Pond and North Pond are indeed shallow and relatively small, where Great Pond, Salmon, Long, and Snow Ponds are quite a bit bigger and quite a bit deeper. The number over each lake is the residence time for the water measured in months. So East Pond takes somewhere between uh, two and four years to fill. North Pond, about a year. Great Pond, two years. And we can contrast this to Snow Pond or Long Pond, which fill in less than a year, with residence times of three and eight months, respectively. This flow of water carries nutrients into and out of each lake, and it's important to recognize that all of our lakes are interconnected and in this way interdependent on each other. As we think about the Belgrade Lakes, it's useful to have metrics of water quality that are accepted by both the community that lives around the lake and the greater uh, statewide organization that manages the lakes, like the Department of Environmental Protection. Secchi depth is the most obvious metric of water quality, and that's the de depth that a Secchi disk can be lowered into the lake before it disappears from the view of the observer. Six meters is a really great Secchi depth, typical of large oligotrophic lakes. Oligotrophic means low productivity and low nutrients, um, like Moosehead or Rangely lakes. Uh, many of the Belgrade lakes have good uh, Secchi depth on the order of five meters, but as we approach four meters, that's the warning point for water quality, and the main Department of Environmental Protection defines a lake that's blooming as having a, a Secchi transparency of two meters or less. Similarly, phosphorus, which is the limiting nutrient for many of these lakes, has a typical bloom threshold of 12 parts per million. So we'd like the total phosphorus in our lakes to be below 12. Third is anoxic factor. Anoxic factor is a measure of how much oxygen is in the bottom of the lake. And numerically, it's the number of days in a year that an area of the sediment equal to the size of the surface of the lake is anoxic. So an anoxic factor of 180 would mean that the entire lake is anoxic for half the year. That's really bad. It means that nothing is living in the lake because there's no oxygen. In our lakes, uh, the anoxic factors are on the order of 20 or 30 days, which means that we have significant anoxic water in about half of the volume of the lake for about two months.
And in really clean lakes, the anoxic factor is zero. There's never oxygen depletion in the deep water. And we'll see some illustrations of that in the next few slides. And finally, for this hypoxic factor. And hypoxic factor is the percentage of cold water that is low in oxygen. And, and this number is, is useful in, in measuring how sustainable the lake is for cold water fishing. Uh, many trout species uh, do thrive in cold, well oxygenated water, and if there's no oxygen in the cold water, these species can't survive. I have prepared a simple cartoon to show how phosphorus and oxygen in a lake are interrelated. So let's begin by recognizing that phosphorus in a lake enters through external loads, which is shown here. It exits through stream outflows, so that would be water flowing over the dam on the outflow of a, of a lake. Alternatively, phosphorus can leave um, by settling out of the water column and into the sediment of the lake. Phosphorus is the limiting reagent for most plankton, phytoplankton, and so one phosphorus defines phytoplankton population. Important because the phytoplankton help to define the thermocline. The more plankton there are in the surface water, the more algae there are, the more sunlight is absorbed closer to the surface of the lake, and this tends to bring the thermocline higher up in the water column. The thermocline is the boundary between the warm water and the cold water, and the warm water is caused by absorption of sunlight, and if you absorb the sunlight higher up, the thermocline tends to be higher. That means that the bottom of the lake is cold, and if <clears throat> enough plankton fall to the bottom of the lake, respiration will consume oxygen. So the bottom water is always cold, but it can also be anoxic, depending on the export of biomass from the surface into the deep water. The anoxia plays a critical role in a feedback cycle in the lake because anoxic water helps to reduce iron 3 to iron 2 and iron 3 acts as a chemical sponge to trap phosphorus. So under cold anoxic conditions iron and phosphorus are released into the bottom water and this phosphorus builds up over time, and in this case it builds up over the summer. At the end of the summer, or during a mixing event induced by a large storm, summer storm, uh, the bottom water and the surface water can mix, and this mixing now mixes this benthic released phosphorus up into the water column to produce more plankton. More plankton helps to drive up the thermocline. It creates a higher, higher <clears throat> or excuse me, more significant stratification of the lake, and it accentuates the anoxia. So in this case, we have a, a negative feedback loop, and the cycle is not linear. So all of a sudden, we can get a bloom, um, and we call this the tipping point of the lake. We don't want lakes to start releasing enough internal phosphorus that they can bloom um, independent of, of external loading. An example of a lake with a significant internal phosphorus load is China Lake, um, a lake to the east of the Belgrade Lakes chain, and this is a satellite image showing the green bloom in the surface of the lake, and if you look carefully you can actually see uh, the patches of algae um, from this aerial photograph. This shows the Secchi depth of China Lake um, over time. So the red data is the Secchi that I've circled from 1970 to 1985. And you notice the Secchi went from 6 meters, very good water quality, down to 1.5 meters, really poor water quality. Uh, so this is an example of a lake that has reached its tipping point. And ever since 1990, China Lake has experienced significant blooms or low Secchi transparency on the order of, of one and a half to two meters. Notice that at the same time we're getting this decrease in Secchi transparency, 
we're also getting a significant increase in anoxic factor. And the anoxic factor for China Lake is reaching 60 to 70. Um, so that means that uh, a significant fraction of the lake is anoxic for, for most of the summer. That anoxia is driving the internal load, and the internal load is driving the Secchi transparency. So this is an example of a lake that has tipped. So let's look at some typical temperature and oxygen data of different representative lakes. First thing is that the y-axis is depth. So we're going to move from the surface of the lake downward into the deep water. And in this profile, we're looking at temperature. So cold temperatures are on the left, warm temperatures are on the right. And if we use the blue line as Clearwater Lake, and that's right here, Clearwater Lake is warm in the summer. It goes through a thermocline in the range of 5 to 10 meters, and then the deep water is around uh, 7 degrees C. And all of the lakes in our, in our, rep, in our comparison set have a similar um, profile, warm surface water, a thermocline, and then decreasing temperature with depth. What's strikingly different is the oxygen profiles of these lakes. Um, the oxygen <clears throat> represented by the black line right here, this is the saturation of oxygen in water. So as water cools, it should actually hold more oxygen. And in fact, that's what happens in, in Clearwater Lake. Clearwater is, as its name suggests, a very clear oligotrophic lake, and the oxygen concentration decreases in the deep water um, because of increased solubility of oxygen. If we contrast that to the Belgrades and China Lake, the oxygen concentration drops to near zero um, right below the thermocline. And this is the source of uh, missing oxygen, or this is, is what we'll refer to as mixing, missing oxygen, and it's what we compute when we calculate hypoxic and anoxic factors. To demonstrate how the anoxia has expanded in the Belgrade Lakes, I'll use Great Pond as an example. And this is a plot of depth in meters uh, of the two meter oxygen level. So it's how deep you have to go in the lake to uh, get to two parts per million or less of oxygen. And in the early 70s, you basically had to go to the bottom of the lake. So the lake was reasonably well oxygenated um, all the way to the bottom. But this trend has been increasing with time, so that by 1995, uh, you could reach two parts per million oxygen at a depth of 10 meters, and it's sort of stabilized at around 10 meters um, for the last 10 years. And so this diagram shows the spatial extent of uh, the, the low oxygen water where the blue is uh, 21 meter depth, so there's a couple holes in the lake that are deep. The green area is the 20 to 16 meter oxygen extent. That's what you would have experienced from, say, 74 to the early 90s. And the red area is the spatial extent of anoxia today. Um, the white area um, shows the extent of hypoxia, or, or where oxygen um, gets down to four parts per million. So everywhere that's uh, blue, green, red, or white will no longer support uh, cold water fisheries um, in, in the deep water. Um, and all of those areas have uh, significantly decreased oxygen concentrations. This diagram shows the same type of data, but now as a vertical profile. So again, the, uh, the y-axis is depth, and uh, the <clears throat> x-axis is uh, temperature, uh, phosphorus, or oxygen. So the red line is the temperature of the lake, and this was a profile done in, in October of, of 2014, and so the, the water was relatively cool at the surface, 18 degrees. The thermocline was at 13 meters, so it was late in the fall, the thermocline had... Uh, eroded or moved down into the water column um, due to wind-based mixing in the fall, and the cold water was down at a temperature of about 10 degrees. Notice that the oxygen concentration, the blue profile, um, is high. Uh, right here, it's about uh, 9.5 parts per million, and then it rapidly decreases to uh, basically zero um, 
at a depth of, of 14 meters. So again, that two part per million threshold at this time is, is met at, at 13 meters. The symbols are the phosphorus concentration. And if you recall, our, our metric for water quality was to have phosphorus concentrations uh, below uh, 12 parts per million. And the uh, purple symbols show the Great Pond is at about 10 parts per million. So that's below the, two, the 12 parts per million threshold. However, so that the surface water is at 10, but look at this deep water. The deep water is at uh, almost 50 parts per million phosphorus, and this deep water represents about 10% of the volume of the lake. So if this deep water mixes up into the surface water, and it's 10% of the volume, you're going to attenuate its effect by 10 times. You're going to add 5 parts per million to the surface water, and 10 plus 5 is 15, that's plenty of phosphorus to cause a bloom. This diagram is a plot of water temperature as a function of depth over time in Great Pond for uh, 2013 and uh, 2014. So the, uh, the bright colors uh, represent warm temperatures and the blue colors represent cold temperatures and the thermocline is the boundary between the, the warm temperatures and the cold temperatures. And so you can see the thermocline on, on Great Pond in, in 2014 was around 8 meters, and you, you might argue the thermocline was slightly deeper in, in 2013, maybe uh, 8.5 to 9 meters. The profile that I just showed you was, was taken um, in October, and so the uh, thermocline is, is right here uh, around 13 meters. Now notice that right after I took that profile, the lake mixed. So the water all became uniform in temperature, and we're now going to see the effect of, of that mixing. In this plot, I want to point out three things measured by the research buoy Goldie um, floating in the, in the deep hole um, in the middle of Great Pond. The first thing is the blue data, which is the uh, Schmidt stability of the lake. It is the uh, resistance to mixing when the warm water floats on, on top of the cold water. So when the Schmidt stability is high, um, the lake um, has a lot of resistance to mixing, and when the Schmidt stability decreases, um, this is indication of a, of a mixing event. So if we start at the beginning of the season, the lake has very low stability, it's mixed top to bottom, and we have high oxygen concentrations, because oxygen comes from the atmosphere. So in the beginning of, of uh, June, the oxygen concentration in Grove High was about 10 parts per million. Now, over time, as the lake stratified, the bottom water was cut off from the oxygen supply, and bacteria eating the dead cells in the bottom of the lake consumed all the oxygen until everything in the lake uh, below 10 meters had zero oxygen in, in August uh, 31st. Um, so this was the uh, decrease in oxygen, and we see that this decrease uh, occurs both in, in 2014 and in 2013. The, the final uh, plot that I, or data set that I want to point out is, is the green data, and the green data is the fluorescence in the surface water, and it's an indication of the amount of plankton um, that are growing in the surface of the lake. And you'll notice that we have three spikes in fluorescence, one spike in the middle of July, one spike at the end of August, and one spike uh, in October. And these spikes correspond with mixing events in the lake. Um, they're lagged by about a week, but a mixing event right here um, causes deep water to mix to the surface, it adds phosphorus to the surface, and we get a bloom. A similar mixing event right here uh, triggers a bloom at the end of August, and then the October 31st uh, bloom the Halloween bloom, if you will, um, was caused by the lake finely mixing at the end of the fall. So Great Pond is experiencing uh, small episodic blooms, certainly nothing that decreases the Secchi transparency to two meters, um, but there's still uh, significant blooms that are occurring, and this is the source of concern in terms of ongoing uh, water quality. This diagram is another representation of mixing in Great Pond. Uh, the y-axis in the top panel is temperature, and each line represents a different temperature sensor 
at 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, and 19 meters down in the lake. So the pink line is the temperature at the bottom of the lake, and you notice it starts at, at 4 degrees and warms up slightly all summer long, but it is cold all summer long, where the white line is at the surface, and it warms up and then cools down, warms up during the summer and cools down in the fall. But you'll notice these lines do not have a smooth trajectory. The surface water has distinct spikes here and here. And finally, when it mixes here, and this is showing that the same sort of mixing events that we saw on the previous slide, and the consequence of those mixing events is the spikes in biomass here and end of August and Halloween. In summary, lakes are complex dynamic systems where the biomass of the lake is often controlled by the limiting reagent, which in our lakes is phosphorus. Phosphorus enters the lake from upstream stream flows. Human activity around the edge of the lake, such as shoreline erosion in poorly developed properties, camp road erosion, and failed septic tanks. Phosphorus leaves the lake due to stream outflows and a significant amount of phosphorus is buried in the sediments. A healthy lake has a phosphorus balance where the inflows and outflows result in a final phosphorus concentration in the water column below 8 parts per billion. Bloom events occur when this phosphorus balance is disrupted. In the Belgrades, we are concerned that stable or slowly declining water quality could shift to bloom states by small shifts in the phosphorus balance. These shifts can occur due to increased shoreline development and changes in climate in particular increases in precipitation and average temperatures which will force increased anoxia in the deep water resulting in increasing deep water loading, internal loading of phosphorus to the surface. The Belgrade lakes are hydraulically, politically, and economically interconnected. Solutions to declining water quality in the watershed will take an integrated approach.